good afternoon. How nice to see you all. I am very excited about giving this talk, but I wasn't quite expecting so many people. So I can only say thank you very much for coming along this afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking about REST, and this session is aimed very generally at web developers. I may as well say now, before it becomes any more obvious, that I'm not a Drupal expert. I'm a REST expert. That's what I do. I love APIs. I care about APIs. And I spend most of my time in either straight PHP or any one of the other PHP frameworks. So um, I know a great many things. None of them involve Drupal. Basically, the only thing I knew about Drupal before I came to DrupalCon is that I like to drink with Drupal people. <laughs> so I was very pleased when they accepted my talk. Awesome. So. Um, I have some giveaways for you, and um, I will do that right at the end of the session when I take questions. So if you ask me a question, and you're in the first two people to ask me a question, I will give you a copy of my book. If you have questions at any other point during the session, I am totally happy to take interruptions, but to get my attention, you should go to the microphone, because you can't ask me a question until you get there. So don't raise your hand, go to the mic, and that way the people listening to the recording um, will hear it as well as everybody behind you in the room. So, here we go. REST. REST is all about data. The acronym stands for Representational State Transfer, and it's pretty much what it says on the tin. Right. So we deal in transferring representations of data. Everything is a representation of a resource or of a collection. And we probably represent it in JSON, in XML. Maybe you serialize your PHP or you like YAML or Klingon or I don't really care. But you represent your data any way that you want to. Everything in your system is a resource. Uh, so a user is a resource, an article is a resource, a comment is a resource. We consider everything as a resource and we transfer representations of it. When you're getting lists of resources, we call those collections. Like most very hyped technologies, it's mostly about the words. So a thing, you should say the word resource. And for any kind of list, you should say the word collection. Now you're a REST expert. <laughs> REST is not just about pretty URLs. You do need to have really good routing to do REST well, but the URLs are very important. They tell a story. I have some example URLs on this slide. So you can guess that the top example slash articles is a collection of articles. You might guess that articles slash 2756 is an individual article resource. You're all with me so far. This is excellent. Also, you will see these sub-resources. So I have a specific article resource which has a comments collection associated with it. So rather than getting all the comments in the world ever and filtering for this article, we can make them available as a sub-resource of our article. And then as an example, I've got a, finally an independent, an individual comment resource. So those URLs pretty much describe the data that exists at those URLs. And thinking of data being at a URL is a really good way to think about how this works. <laughs> Typically, when we talk about the web, we are talking about using REST with HTTP. That means that this talk is about REST and it's going to involve quite a lot of HTTP because that's the example that I'm using. HTTP is an awesome format. It has lots and lots of features that make implementing elegant data transfer very, very easy. So I am going to talk to you about verbs and how we use those in a RESTful API. I'm going to talk about status codes, why they are so important, and under what conditions I will hunt you down and kill you. And I'm going to talk about headers. Um, and I want to talk about how those fit in, also in the context of a browser and also of a mobile device. So I've got some examples for all of those things. We'll start with verbs. 
Verbs define the operations that we perform on our resource. So we use the same URL regardless of whether we are reading a resource, creating one, changing one, deleting one. And the verb tells us which of those things we're doing. As web developers, you already know about get and post. I'm going to add two more into that list for you, and that's the put and delete verbs. When we use the get verb on a collection, that will fetch all the resources in a collection. So we'll get representation, representations of each resource in a collection. If you do a get request to a single resource, you'll just get the representation of that resource. And the representations are the same, regardless of whether it appears in a collection or as an individual resource. We use the post verb to create a new resource. So you make a representation of the resource, you craft together whatever representation language you're going to use, and you post it to the collection that the new resource will live inside. So it's a bit like doing an insert on a MySQL table. You just send the data without the primary key, and the database comes back and gives you the, the last insert ID. And in this case, the, day, the REST server will come back and give you the URL where that resource will exist. We use put to change a record. So you would get a resource, change it as you need to, and then use the put verb to put it back where it belongs. I have create in brackets because you can put a new record to a known URI if the client gets to make the decision about what the URI will be. That's not often the case, hence the brackets. Guess what the delete verb does? <laughs> right, so you have a resource at a particular URI, you want to delete it, make a request with the delete verb. Good, you're keeping up. Let's talk about status codes. Status codes are the headline news. They come back with the response from a server and they tell you what happened. Typically, these are the most common ones. 200 means everything is okay. Most frameworks, CMSs and other tools will emit a 200 by default. If I make a request to your API and there's something wrong and you send me an HTML error message and a 200 status code, that is the moment I will hunt you down and kill you. <laughs> I integrate with a lot of other people's APIs. I'm just getting less and less tolerant as I get older. The 201 status is something that you will see in RESTful services because we are posting a new resource representation to a collection and creating a record. You are going to see full-on examples of this soon, but it was quite codey, so I thought we could do the story first and then I would drown you with code. So the created tells you that something was created. Right. The 204 response is one that you do sometimes see and it, it's literally 200, everything's cool, and I have intentionally sent you empty body content. This is used, for example, when you delete something, right? If you request the server deletes something, I did delete it, I have nothing to tell you. <laughs> like, it's gone. <laughs> so it's not really a 200, because if you saw a 200 with a blank body, you might be confused. And we use, use 204 for that specific case. Anything beginning with a two is good news. Anything beginning with a three is yes, but there's something we need to talk about. So the example here that I've given is 304 for not modified. You would use this with something like a last modified or um, an e-tag header where you've requested the, a resource you've received the resource, it had some information about its version in it. Next time you request the resource, you send information about which version you have. If you have the current version, the server says 304, and it doesn't need to send you anything else. You just use the version that you have. So that saves repeat transmission of data that does not change often. 
very, very useful for sites which need to scale. Anything beginning with a four means you did something wrong. The 400 bad request is kind of a non-specific, I don't really know what's going on here. So you probably sent bad data um, or the server was stupid and didn't understand some combination of that. The 404 is specifically you asked me for a record that wasn't found. So literally you did a get request on something and it, it doesn't exist, it is not there. So those are the common status codes and there are many, many more. There's a fabulous Wikipedia page. If you want to lose the rest of the session reading about status codes, you should look it up right now. Um, and it has a very improbably large list of status codes. The things that you need to know are you should go there and you should use the right status code, even if it's as simple as 400, something went wrong, 200, everything's cool. That's a good start. There are status codes covering all kinds of things from redirects to problems with you must authenticate, uh, your authentication is invalid, this record doesn't exist anymore, this record was updated since you last used it, and so on. So there's lots that you can do there to make your APIs more informative to the user. The more information that you can give to whoever or whatever is consuming your API, the less likely they are to open support tickets and the more likely you will make it to the pub. That's the aim of the game. Let's talk about HTTP headers. This is something which, because we don't see headers, when we are working with the browser, the browser handles that side of things and we really only see the body. As web developers, sometimes we don't pay quite enough attention to this aspect. So I have some example request headers. A lot of my code examples will look like this. If you are a long way back in this room, you probably can't read the code samples, in which case, feel free to download the slides. They're linked from the footer of lornajane.net and they're also on the session page for this session on the conference website. If you make a, ge a general get request to lornajane.net using this, this was made by curl. I'm not gonna do a big tangential rant about curl, but if you'd like one, please see me in the bar later. We send some headers, and in this case, we're just sending three headers. We're sending the user agent, which says what it was that made the request. This is totally unreliable. Um, you can send any user agent you like using most of the tools. All of these headers are as trustable as get, post, or cookie data, i.e. they are not. The host header saying which domain the request was made to and the accept header. This is a horrible example of an accept header and you'll find out why in a moment. Here are the response headers which come back if you hit lornajane.net. You get some information about my web server, um, the Apache version, the PHP version, where you can ping back to if you're linking to one of my wildly popular blog posts. Um, some caching information, the content type. You've just made a request to a website and the content is in HTML. That's good, and for rest, we'll start to look at things which are not HTML. When the body is not HTML, the content type shouldn't be either. Some dates, there's a varnish header in there. I'm running WordPress, so I'm running varnish in front of it. We negotiate content format using those pair, those twin headers, they're sisters, really, a content type and an accept. So when you make the request, you say, I accept this format or this list of formats. This slide shows the example that my browser sends. So this is a standard Chrome header, and it, this is the accept header that a default Chrome installation sends, saying, I understand HTML, XHTML, and, well, XML, and failing that, star slash star, whatever else you've got, I'll have that. So that's why curl sends the star slash star. Curl does not understand every file format ever invented. It's just trying to get you something that you can work with. To pass this accept header, you need to think of this header as a series of comma-separated values. Here's the header again. 
So we split the comma separated value, we split this string on comma separated values, which give us some um, types and some which have an extra Q thing in. The Q is a measure of preference. The default is one, and anything less than one is less preferred. So you can say, I really want XHTML, and if you have XML, okay, and as a fallback, okay, plain text, but it's 0.5. So you can, you can not just send a list, but also send information about really what you want and what you'll settle for. So that's, that's different things. In addition to accept, we also have accept language, accept encoding, and accept character set. So for different kinds of clients that will understand or want the content in different versions or different encodings, um, you, can, you can do things like this. Is everyone okay so far? That's good. This is the point at which I got really bored of telling you about all the wonderful HTTP textbook things. I wrote the textbook, I have some to give away, and you can read that at your leisure. I'd now like to show you some examples of how I really use these kinds of services. All of my examples use GitHub. Has anyone here used GitHub? Ah, that's quite a lot of hands. Good, well done. So GitHub have a really good API. It covers things we're familiar with because we're developers, and they also have implemented quite a good RESTful platform. So that's why I really like it as an example. Here, I'm making a GET request to the collection of issues on my demo repo. I'm Lorna Jane on GitHub. Feel free to click around so you can see this on the web. I make a GET request. I send the user agent, the host header, and the accept header. Spot, there's an additional header in this request, and it's an authorization header. GitHub uses something called OAuth, where you negotiate with GitHub to acquire an authorization. That's an access token. So, authorization, name of token, and then your access token here. And you send this as a header. So we're not cluttering up our RESTful requests and responses with usernames, passwords, who knows what else chucked in as query parameters or somewhere in the body. REST clears that out of the way. It uses the envelope format of HTTP to wrap that into a header. It's part of the request, but it's the address on the outside of the envelope, not the birthday card that's on the inside. It separates our content from the negotiation and the metadata. So that's an OAuth header. Um, it's worth getting into this if you're going to work with GitHub because they allow 60 requests per hour per IP, unless you're authenticated. Try running a workshop with that going on. You get like 1,500 an hour. Oh, you're going to get some headers with examples. So the response to my request for a collection of issues, this is the headers. I make the get request and the response comes back. The first line says 200, okay. We're doing something right, this is good news. We get some information about the server, the date, the content type. This is very important. If a response or a request actually has any body associated with it, so when you're making a request, a post request or a put request will have some body data. It therefore needs a content header. Any response will usually have some body data. It needs a content type header. Because otherwise, how do you know how to unpack the body? This is really important. If I, if I make a request to your API, and I, my accept header says I want JSON, if you send me, well, if you send me JSON, I still need a content type header. But if you've sent me XML, then I really need a content type header. Because if you have the wrong version of PHP, it seg faults when you JSON decode nonsense. So we need to be really careful about sending the correct metadata. In this case, GitHub is sending me JSON. GitHub actually only supports JSON. Sometimes that's acceptable. It depends on the application. Status, they sent me another status header. We've got some caching information. We've got a last modified and an e-tag. We've got some XOAuth scopes. 
that's a GitHub specific thing saying what, what stuff I can do with my access token. I know it's GitHub specific because the header starts with an X dash. It is valid in HTTP to use any header you like. You can invent your own so long as the client and the server understand them. Occasionally things go wrong in between if you have deep packet inspection. But in general, in HTTP specification terms, it's completely valid. However, it's conventional to prefix your invented headers with X dash, just so everybody knows that they are custom to your application. Uh, what else have I got in here? Oh, the last line is a content length, which helps you know if you have correctly passed it and if it's all arrived and, and so on. So that's a good one. We've made a get request. We saw that. We've, made, we've got the response. This was the headers. This is the body of the response. It's actually a really edited body of the response, and even then, I think the text size is still a bit small. This returns us the URL. This is how we identify this issue. It has a unique URL. We will be making requests to this with different verbs. There's a link to the comments URL. That's an associated collection. So it's a collection of comments that relates to this URL and the resource includes information on how to get there. We call this hypermedia. As you can see, it's a bit like hyperlinks. Isn't nearly as complicated or trendy as probably it can be made to sound. So yes, a link to another place where you can find things. There is a title, it's broken, and a body. This thing does not work, representing a typical bug report. If you look at the user line, you can see that I chopped a bunch, a bunch of JSON out of here. Inside there was actually a whole representation of my user details on GitHub, which wouldn't fit on the screen. But it meant that if you were showing a list of issues, you could see who opened the issue. You could link to my account. It's got my avatar and so on. So that's all included in the issue because you probably don't want to show the issue without showing additional information. Whether or not you include that information or link to it with some kind of hypermedia is completely up to you. I'll pause to say something about hypermedia. They, it literally is just hyperlinks, right? If you were doing a page that represented DrupalCon, you might have some hyperlinks to the individual talks. If you're doing it in an API, give me some hypermedia to the talk resources, or maybe a list, a collection of talks. It's exactly the same thing. And actually, the design of the user journey through an API using these links is very much in a parallel to the way that we understand the way our web users use it. So whether it's another application that consumes your API, whether it's your, your own mobile app, we're thinking about this design. Where would they need to go from here? Which data needs to be included? Using hypermedia means that clients can navigate for themselves. They can grab the issue resource and follow the comments property, use the value of that to find where the comments should be. As an API provider, this means that once in a while you can break your URLs because people are not concatenating things together with IDs. I try never to return IDs, like raw IDs, from a RESTful API because it leads to people concatenating things together when actually all the links they need are here, and if not, I've missed something and they should tell me. Okay, let's talk about a post request. This is a little bit more interesting than the get request because we get to send some data. This is a post request. I'm gonna create an issue. No, I'm gonna create a comment, that's right. The comment's really small and simple and fitted on my slide. So I'm gonna put a comment, a new comment, against the issue that you just saw. So I make a post request to the collection of where the comments go for this issue. I'm sending some headers, user agent host, accept header, content type. I'm sending a content type because I'm sending body data. If you send body data, please send a content type. There's my authorization token again. This is not a valid GitHub token, by the way, because I'm crazy, but not that crazy. Um, <laughs> all my slides are in text-based markup, so I make it all and then I do a find and replace. 
<laughs> and just scramble my key. Content length, 37. And on the last line, you can see the JSON that I sent. The only required field for a comment is the body of the comment. It knows who I am. I'm logged in. It's got my access token. So all I need to do is just stick some words in there and I can send it. So I'm asking GitHub to create a comment. And the response comes back, 201 created. So that's good news. It's acknowledging that a new resource was made in response to my request. Content type, application JSON, cool. So I know how to understand the body. What else have I got? A location header, a redirect header came back with my created acknowledgement. This is a redirect to the URL of the new comment resource. So it's very common to get a 201 and a redirect. So you post to the collection and you'll get redirected to the new record. It's quite an elegant way of doing things and it's very common. Content length, e-tag, cache control, standard HTTP things. So the body contains the new comment. There's the URL of the new comment, the URL of the issue in the API that it relates to. I've chopped the URLs so that you would have some idea of what the more interesting end would look like. Again, I've chopped my user record, but it's still in there. So you can see who made this comment, link through to their URL, their avatar, any other information that you want. Some timestamps and the body. So, so far so good. We have fetched data from GitHub, and we have posted data to GitHub. And REST is all about working with data. You already know how to work with databases. Um, and typically, this is just, it goes in your storage layer. And the fact that actually some of this data is somewhere else over an HTTP request doesn't matter to most of your application. The put request, we use put to update things. And to use put first, you must use get. So you do get. You fetch the record, make whatever change you need to do, so that now you have a new representation, and then put it. And you put it back where you got it from. Think of tidying up your bedroom, right? You get something, change it, put it back to the same URL with a put verb with your request. So you grab it, you get the JSON representation, change the JSON representation, put back to the original location, and the response comes back with a 200 OK. And it just sends us the new version of the resource because we're still on the same uh, URL. So it just sends us the same, the same version of the resource with the updated e tags and last modified and so on. Which would be lovely, except GitHub don't actually use put. Um, they're a really good example for, of a RESTful service, but they don't implement put, they implement patch. Now this is interesting, There's a, it's controversial actually, um, and I'm going to explain it to you anyway. Good, excellent. The um, GitHub use patch. Patch deals with incremental changes, right? You know what a diff is and you diff uh, and you get just the changes and you patch and you apply those small changes to the existing thing. This is the same thing in HTTP. Pure REST says you must only deal in whole representations. That, you know, there can be no data validation, there can be no violation. You must take the entity and put the entity and never diverge. Well, in the real world, that's not terribly useful. So patch allows us to just change, for example, the email address on a very large user record. You might not want to get the whole representation of an article to change the title or add a tag. So patch lets us work around this and GitHub uses it. So in, in the hope that I won't blind anyone with science, here's the patch request. All I'm going to do here is make a change by sending a new body to the comment that I just made. So there's the URL of where the comment um, went. User agent host, accept header, content type because I'm sending body, Authorization, because I need to be logged in as me to edit my own comments, exactly as I would be on the website. When I'm testing this, I do it with GitHub open in my browser in the other window, and I make the request and I refresh the page, and I go, oh yeah, cool, good. 
And that's literally how this works. If you have the mobile client for GitHub, or like I use it on the tablet, that's what it's using. It's the API behind the scenes. Probably their website consumes it as well. So I send just what I want to change. In this case, I'm just changing the wording of the comment. I have improved my comment. Back comes the response, 200 OK. And that includes, um, as the body, the full representation of the new comment, just for completeness, I guess. So that's patch, just, just changing a single, a single entry rather than having to collect, change, and then put back a whole record. I quite like put. Patch is not widely supported, but definitely part of REST conversations now. So I really wanted to include it so that I could show you. <sighs> Easy. OK, the delete request, guess what it does? You send the delete verb and name the thing that you want to delete. Again, of course, I have to send my authorization header because you, you can only delete my comment on GitHub if you're logged in as me. Um, and back comes the response, 204, no content. There's nothing to send me. I'd, the resource is not there, and I asked for it not to be there. So it comes back, 204, no content. And that's a 200, but deliberately content length zero. If you are working with GitHub, be aware that you, if you are ever sending post, put, or patch with empty body for some reason, starring repos works like this, you do need to send the content length of zero. So I have gone through examples of all the four and a bit verbs, four verbs that I would have liked to have used, and patch, because GitHub uses it and it's an important topic in REST. I want to talk a bit more now about making the most of HTTP and about some of the allied architecture decisions that you will see. And I think these apply whether you are implementing and publishing your own RESTful service or whether you just want to integrate with something which already publishes data over REST. You saw the authorization header. It's a very tidy way of exchanging identity credentials when working with a RESTful service because all of the details are in the header. You have a couple of options. Um, you can use basic auth if you want to. This is a very mature, well understood, well supported platform. You already know how it works. Why not apply it to your API? As a web developer, you have most of the skills you already need to work with APIs, all of them, different kinds of APIs. So, use the basic auth. Actually, probably use digest. Same thing, but encrypted. Um, passing things in the headers. Using tokens. Why would I use a token over using your actual user credentials? Well, it's because lots of things are now logging in to Twitter, GitHub, Flickr, as me. Most of them are on my phone. Uh, some of them are our clients on a tablet. They might be uh, exchanging data when I post to Flickr, for example. The photos appear on Facebook. There are lots and lots of things accessing my accounts. Using a token means that if I don't want just that to have access anymore, I can revoke one token because every single integration point has its own token. So whether you follow a formal process such as OAuth, or whether you're rolling your own tokens, it's a very good way of revoking access for something without the user having to change their credentials and then update every other thing that uses it. So a very, very sound approach. I could talk for an hour about OAuth, and again, I'm gonna try not to, but find me in the bar. Um, OAuth in 30 seconds. Why did I think this was a good idea? Okay. So, <laughs> There is so much I want to tell you about OAuth. Um, OAuth handles the relationship between you, something which has your data, and something else that you'd like to have some potentially limited access to your data. If you give your username and password to your Flickr mobile phone app, then that app perhaps might use your credentials to log into Flickr, impersonating you. OAuth gets around that and sort of deals with the fact that there are 
three players. There's you, there's Flickr, and then there's the app. And you kind of all get together and you say, you say to Flickr, okay, um, I'd really like you to grant some access, please, to my data for this app. When the app accesses Flickr, Flickr knows it's the app and not you. That access might be restricted in scope. Um, it might be read-only. Twitter does read-only. It might be limited for time. It might only be valid for a month or however long it takes. If you decide that the app that you downloaded from who knows where turns out not to be all that reputable and it's polluting your Twitter stream, you can revoke the token without necessarily having to revoke your user's access or any other access to that same provider. So that's what OAuth is for. It's for giving something else access to your data that lives on a particular provider. Um, you'll see a lot about OAuth. OAuth 1 should not be touched with a barge pole. OAuth 2 finally made it into a real spec that bears no resemblance to the way that people actually implement it. But OAuth 2 is really, really good. All you need to know is that you will generate tokens and you will use SSL. So do OAuth 2, do it over HTTPS, good implementation. That was much quicker than telling you the whole story. Okay, let's talk about caching headers. You already know a lot about caching headers because you cache assets on websites. Basically the same things apply. It's very important to get caching correct because when your mobile app goes in the top 10 for your country, then your back end is gonna fall over. Um, caching headers will help you to make the most of your hardware and reduce the load for everybody. The expires header gives inf the, the client information about how long it can keep a particular piece of content. We use eTag or last modified to check that something's changed. So you saw the example with the 304 header. When I make a request and I retrieve some content, it comes with an eTag or a last modified date. When I request the same endpoint, the same URI in the future, I send as a header the if modified since or the eTag. If it hasn't changed, the server just sends me a 304. That's very, very quick. Using REST over something like RPC or SOAP, which is all post requests, means that things like the reverse proxy caches, varnish and so on, can help you in terms of caching. Because if it's just a get request and all of the, all of the responses will be the same, then you can cache it. A post request can't be cached because it's not a safe operation. So REST recognizes that. Get is always safe and we can probably cache that. I mentioned right at the start that I run Varnish in front of my WordPress installation. There's no personalization on my site. The only person who can log in is me. So when I write a blog post, quite often I do see a spike of traffic. Varnish can just handle that for me. Everybody's seeing exactly the same thing. Don't need to wait for WordPress to do its thing and generate some output. We'll just cache it and send it. The other advantage of the caching headers, I'm not sure how I got onto a Varnish tangent, the other advantage of the caching headers is that it allows us to detect changes in version when we are trying to do an update. You can clearly see that this get, change things, put, is not atomic. The caching headers help us with that. So when we send the put, we can send what our last modified timestamp was, or we can send our e-tag. The server can then make a decision about whether our version can overwrite or not. And there's a 409 conflict status code, which would say, generally, no, I don't think that's a good idea. For the most of the time, it's fine. But it would allow us, if your application needs to know that, that there was a race condition, we can detect it, and that's an additional side effect of these caching headers. I want to talk in general about RESTful services, just as I kind of wrap up this talk, I want to try and place them in the, in the wider world of the web and, and of mobile. When to use REST? There's two provisos here. REST lends itself very well to data-driven applications. So if you are mostly working with data, uh, I work on an open source project called Joined In, 
It is a list of events, the events have talks, and the talks all have feedback, have comments on them. You can kind of imagine that this database has about five tables in it, right? It's really, really data-driven, so it lends itself very well to a RESTful model because it's just representing data. Your sort of products and orders and that kind of thing, again, small things. If you have very batch-driven, functional sort of, I'm trying not to say paradigm, uh, functional paradigm kind of applications, then REST is less of a good selection. The other limiting factor for when you can choose REST is when it is understood or could be understood. REST is not widely used in every aspect of the web community yet. I would say more so for mobile, less so perhaps for traditional web. And if you are integrate, if you're building a, a REST API to integrate with somebody else, particularly if they are, I'm going to insult somebody. Um, <laughs> No, there isn't a way around this. Particularly if they are Java or .NET developers, they may not be able to understand REST. So, <laughs> so the tool support is less good. They like SOAP because there's a button, and then their thing does a thing. Right. <laughs> this is a really scientific explanation of the problems with integrating with other communities. Within web scripting languages and the mobile space, you will find REST is well supported. Drupal obviously going way more in that direction moving forward. Uh, but that can sometimes be a limiting choice. I'm a consultant, I'm an expert on REST, I work with lots and lots of people, and sometimes they build RPC services. So it's about trying to understand the problem and make the best recommendations that you can. If you are gonna design a RESTful service, then these are my parting tips. Um, Try to remember that we are, we are modeling everything in terms of resources. Everything's a resource. Every operation um, is, you dictate which one is happening by using a verb. And all of the metadata, which is not part of the resource, gets sent in the header. If you have a verb in your URL, you are doing it wrong. When you're designing any kind of service, please consider the failure case. To API providers, users look like idiots. They're not, I promise, they just haven't read the instructions. So consider what happens when things go wrong. The measure of how good your service is, is how it treats someone when they've done the wrong thing. That's a measure of robustness, of reliability, and again, keeps the support tickets down and you can go to the pub. You'll have decisions to make about how much data to return. Are you gonna return every field available to be associated with this resource? Because when you do a list of articles or products or whatever it is, that's going to be a lot of data. Or are you going to offer a more abbreviated format with the option, perhaps as a sub-resource or by passing a query parameter, to get more data? Sometimes you might choose to send less data, making more available somewhere else. A good example is blog articles, because all of the fields are small apart from the body, which is humongous. You don't want that when you're returning a collection. You might even publish it as a separate sub-resource. Sometimes you'll want to do the exact opposite and pull some, un, some related resource into your current representation. And the example is the issues and the comments with the user resource nested inside it that we saw for GitHub. You never want to display an issue without saying who logged it or a comment without saying who made this comment. So you'll always want to nest that data even though they're probably stored in different database tables. So those are the kinds of decisions that you will want to make when you come to publish your own APIs. I'm hoping that this has given you an overview, whether you will be publishing your own or whether you'll be integrating with RESTful services elsewhere on the web, of what's going on and why it's done the way it is. What are we trying to achieve with these new and unfamiliar verbs? What's with the pretty URLs? So hopefully I've given you some overview at that point. 
Now, I do have 15 minutes left. I am going to take questions. The first two that I take will get a copy of the book. The microphone is there. <laughs> Run. Excuse me. What happens if you put an incomplete object? Does it delete the fields? Um, does it delete the fields or the, the, the values that it does not contain, or does it save them in the, the system, or does that depend entirely on your API? Okay, when you put an incomplete record, what should happen? Depends on your application. I mean, in true RESTful terms, it should reject it because it's a bad representation. If they're optional fields, you probably would write some business logic that just worked, skipped over them. You decide if you want to null them or leave their old values. Technically, I think you should probably null them, but. Cool. Come here and get a book. Next question. I'm a little confused on the jargon. Um, okay. Just because I work with a lot of other developers that are a lot smarter than me, or I guess more knowledgeable on this. Um, one of the developers I work with the other day said, I've never built a REST API before, but I've built a RESTful one. And based on your presentation, I'm trying to think that's the same thing. I think it's the same thing, but I'd like to give you some advice. When you're publishing a RESTful API, you should always advertise it as an HTTP web service, and that way the religious zealots won't hunt you down and kill you. <laughs> Come and get a book. Yeah. I made an application using Angular, and it actually put out a request for uh, XML, and I had acceptance criteria where I wanted to get back uh, application XML, and I read that was the correct way to do it, and we had issues delivering it where it was actually put on an IIS server, which would return a text XML return. I so can't of course it was help you with IIS. It. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's, there's two schools of thought. I, I consider application XML to be the correct way to represent it. Um, if IIS thinks it's text XML, then you probably just need to pander to that. It's whatever works. Sorry. More questions, yay. Hey, um, quick question. Um, How is a good approach for handling relationships? Uh, let's say uh, we have uh, people uh, related to uh, like workplaces. Is it a good or a bad uh, practice to include all the workplaces in the return for a person. Okay, so this is a really good question, and it's about publishing, do you want to nest related data, or do you just want to make it available? And if you would normally want to see the list of workplaces every time you retrieve that user record, then nest them by all means. If typically you might want to and you might not, I would recommend that you publish a collection as like a sub-resource to that person record. So if every time you requested the person, you would have to request the workplaces collection, that adds quite a lot of overhead, especially for a mobile client, because the connection overhead can be horrible if you're on a slow, if you're on a slow connection. So then I would nest it. If you sometimes need it and sometimes don't, I probably would try and keep them separate. Okay, perfect. I think I Thank said you. it depends, but yeah. thanks. <laughs> More questions? Why don't you need to perform a get request first when you perform a patch? You don't need to perform a GET request when you perform a patch. Well, I guess you probably do need to know which fields are there, but you know which record you need to update. You need to do it really for a put so that you've got a representation to edit, whereas with a patch, you're just sending a thing, so you don't need the template of the previous version. I was delighted to uh, see your examples of, um, with the GitHub API, because I was just working with it in the last uh, two weeks. and. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about um, selecting libraries and whether, whether um, when you interact with the service, um, do you choose a PHP library like one of the ones that GitHub um, recommends um, or features? Um, and if so, uh, any tips on evaluating libraries? Or, or maybe you just interact, send your own rest requests. I do everything from curl, right? Yeah. Um, it depends. It depends hugely what the application I'm building it into is. So some of the frameworks have very good support for RESTful APIs. Sometimes it's worth pulling in one of the wrapper libraries, like you say GitHub has user contributed PHP libraries. Typically, if I have the choice, I'll use the Peckle HTTP extension in PHP. It's fast, it's easy to use, it's well supported. 
Um, that's fairly rare. I guess not many of you use Peckle, but there's a cool client called Guzzle as well, which might help. To evaluate, I literally set a, a tiny task and three things I want to try and try and do all three in an afternoon. And the one that makes me swear the least, that's the one. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to talk about semantics. So in your example, we have on the GitHub and comments of the issue. So when we want to see all comments of the issue X, we call issue slash X slash comments, right? Yeah. And we get a list of the comments with IDs. So I want then to get the full object of the comment ID. So I will call issue slash X slash comment slash Y, right? But how it confirms with the thing that it's sub-resource, but then I can provide also resource that will be just slash comment slash Y. Okay, so what you would normally see is under issues slash X slash comments, it's a collection, and the resources will each have their own URI or URL field, which just goes to slash comments slash Y. So those individual resources would normally, be, they, they do belong under, belong under slash comments, but they also belong under slash issue slash X slash comments. But when you see the list of resources, I wonder if I have it. If you, when you see the list of resources, then you will see each one of them contains this URL field, which is the first in this example, and that is where you will find the comment, at that URL. Did so, I answer your question? Yeah, so, um, as I understand, I will need to implement still slash comment slash y, and then in URL... I usually don't. Slash comments returns this. So the, the resource, which is a comment, appears in multiple collections because it's applicable to multiple collections. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay. you. Hi. I want Hi. to say this is one of the best sessions I've attended all week. It's, it's really been excellent. Thank you. If you'd all like to leave that comment on my feedback, that'd be <laughs> lovely. Uh, so GitHub has this custom verb patch, so assumedly they allow custom verbs to be created. Um, I've, I've worked with SOAP where you can get a WSDL back telling you what you can do on the server. How can you find out what verbs are available on a, on a REST? No, you server? can't. Um, REST will have accompanying documentation. Patch technically is a custom verb because it's not part of a spec, but it's widely used by lots of different APIs to perform exactly this sort of diff patch thing. Um, REST doesn't come with a WSDL or equivalent. Right. What you will get is usually good hypermedia from some kind of starting point and usually good documentation, often interactive. Did that answer your question? So you have to request the documentation, you can't... Yeah, Get, I mean, no if you have a look at yet. GitHub's docs, it's actually quite good, but yeah, it, there isn't a machine discoverable documentation. Okay. Um, if you are interested in this stuff, then look up something called HAL, which is a standardized way of adding hypermedia in so that things can spider your like start from a point and find all the related resources and collections and sort of find their way around. I typically find that most clients need a custom implementation anyway. It's like not knowing what the database tables are called, just you get a li you guess, and, but hopefully that helps. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Hey. Hello. Uh, I just have a couple questions. Um, when is it appropriate to use query string parameters in your URL versus like a resource, a forward slash? That's a really good question. When is it appropriate to use query parameters? When you, they are, you're making a GET request and those parameters are separate from the resource identifier. So we're going to have like issue slash 42 and anything extra like you want the verbose representation of this resource or sometimes people support the format as well as a query parameter instead of just the um, accept, because not everyone understands how to use accept. Not all client-side JavaScript libraries know how to use accept. So anything which is extra information specific to the resource or collection, so it's not really metadata, specific to the resource or collection, but don't do issues 42 slash verbose slash yes slash the other dot XML. Right, those things go somewhere else. Okay. Did that answer the question? Yes. Good. Uh, the other question I had was, um, 
all these examples are obviously focusing on uh, string-based or textual-based data going back and forth. What about binary situations? Is there anything REST can do there, or do you need to? I mean, yes. There's no reason why you shouldn't do, for example, images this way, because we're not we're not version controlling them. We're saying, please give me a representation of a resource. There's no reason why that shouldn't be JPEG. Please accept this representation of a resource. No reason why that shouldn't be JPEG. So I, the same principles would apply if you want to work that way. Thank you. My pleasure. Wow, am I done? I like it when this happens. Cool. Excellent. So I am going to say thank you very much. This is the book that I, I was giving away. Um, PHP Web Services is my newest book, so I'm still like super excited because I have an O'Reilly animal book. I came here a year ago, not quite, to OSCON, met the O'Reilly people, told them I wanted to write this book. I'm back in Portland and I'm holding it in my hands. This is the place where magic is made. So that's it. Please leave me some feedback. I am completely new to DrupalCon, and it's been amazing. And if you would like to get in touch with me, I do a lot of API consultancy and training. Or if you just want to read my blog, send me an email, whatever. That would be lovely. My details are there. Thank you so much for your time.